Thanks. Yeah, so this is a um, quick overview of the tech uh, we've been exploring at Fermi. Uh, and then some food for thought on how to apply um, trusted computing to scientific research. Uh, so down to the data generation and acquisition phase. Uh, so we've heard that obviously in recent years we've had uh, lots of hacks and incidents of surveillance, uh, compromising user privacy and mostly due to the centralization of big tech companies. Um, oops. So yeah, the, this recently came out, uh, Bloomberg, um, last month about um, supposedly Chinese uh, military uh, adding chips to mic super micro servers, and that's a Chinese company that manufactures uh, servers that Apple, Amazon, and big tech companies uh, buy and then deploy in their clouds. Um, then Apple obviously refuted all that, so we're not entirely sure if it's fake news or not, but the point is that um, they, uh, according to Bloomberg, the Chinese put this super tiny chip into the servers, and um, that kind of chip was being used to secretly add instructions to the CPU uh, that allowed basically China supposedly to eavesdrop on cloud communications. Um, so uh, obviously Apple, um, you know, the, the, the big tech companies are having their own solutions uh, regarding to privacy. Um, so Apple has push, been pushing the envelope on this, uh, both on the consumer side, uh, on the hardware and on the software side. So um, on the consumer devices, they have this T2 chip uh, on MacBooks and the uh, A7 and onwards chip on iPads, iPhones, and also the Apple Watch. So what, what they, th these uh, processors uh, have is a coprocessor that includes a secure enclave, and what that is is uh, basically a hardware filter that uh, would act as a barrier between even the CPU, so the processing unit in your device, uh, and the information, in this case it's used mostly for Face ID, Touch ID, data, so the biometric information that you give to your phone is never being accessed even at the hardware level. Um, so obviously this is uh, kind of a secure system, this is the main architecture. Uh, so yeah, the memory even can access the, the main biometric data that uh, you give when you access your phone in that case. Um, on the software side, uh, there's So on the software side, there's a thing called homomorphic encryption. Uh, Apple in particular is using something a step behind this, which is called differential privacy, and it's about anonymizing data sets before uh, at the data generation event, so on the device itself before the data is, is actually sent. But the problem with this is that um, recent research has shown, especially this year, that these data sets can be de-anonymized. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it's not the, the most uh, secure um, method that we have these days. So uh, there's another step after that called homomorphic encryption. And what that is is a, a cryptographic approach where you can co do computations on the actual uh, encrypted data itself. Um, the problem with this is it's a mostly academic approach so it's very slow, uh, even though this table uh, will show you when um, these use cases could be implemented, especially in healthcare, uh, in one or two years. Um, because the point is that um, data is already encrypted at rest and in, uh, in transport, so communicate like SSL, TLS, and at rest is using databases. But the problem is how do you encrypt data efficiently when it's in memory? Uh, so obviously with homomorphic en encryption you don't have this issue because the actual computation is happening on encrypted data itself. Uh, but it's basi basic, very basic operations like addition and multiplication, so it's still a, a research area. So this is a practical use case that you would have, uh, I think, in uh, the talks before we, we got a similar scenario for healthcare data. And in practice, what happens is that you encrypt uh, your blood sample, in that case, with the private key. Then you send the, 
data to the server, and then you have server-side processing using just the public key um, on the encrypted values. And so uh, when the server sends the, the data back, the client actually decrypts using his own private key. So everything is happening uh, with encrypted data. Uh, so the big tech companies are having their own approaches to this, uh, especially Microsoft and IBM. They have uh, released this paper uh, a while ago called Pinocchio, which is an approach on uh, trusted uh, computation. Uh, verify computation, um, and this is a uh, in the like it's not a, an academic effort. It's actually a much faster approach. So um, the it, it, it's the concept also behind the well known in the cryptocurrency space uh, zk snarks so zero knowledge proofs. Uh, this is a different implementation, but it's using the same underlying approach of verified computation. So it's a much faster. Um, implementation because you can take a program, run it on an untrusted server, so let's take the example of the super micro hacked server, uh, and then check the output with a proof, and this is all happening in software. Um, yeah, then you have Amazon side trail, that is another effort from Amazon, doing the same stuff. Um, but yeah, in the, in the blockchain cryptocurrency space, uh, those are the main uh, efforts for, for this kind of stuff. So you have uh, CryptoNote, the CryptoNote protocol that is uh, Monero, basically, as a cryptocurrency. Uh, and that is basically using ring, ring signatures to, uh, to protect transactions. Um, like last month, they added uh, research coming out of Stanford called Ballot Proofs, and they actually implemented that in the, uh, on their blockchain, uh, which would... Uh, reduce the size of the, of the transactions a lot. So this is research happening really, really fast and being implemented in the real world. And uh, after that, we have zero knowledge proofs. And that is uh, probably the most interesting development in cryptography because it allows you to uh, prove, uh, like you have basically a prover and a verifier. Uh, so the, like in that case, the, at the data generation phase, uh, you'd like to transmit that you actually own that data without revealing the data itself. So that's the zero knowledge part. Um, and yeah, in Zcash, the cryptocurrency Zcash implements that for uh, financial transactions. And then um, one step after that is what's called um, T's, so like trusted execution environments. Uh, and that is, mm, you have that, let's say, implemented in hardware wallets. Uh, but in particular, you have Project Enigma from MIT uh, that is using this technique to uh, uh, create basically secret contracts on Ethereum. Um, and so using uh, the uh, trusted execution uh, environment, what that is is um, an implementation mainly from Intel called Intel SGX. And it's an isolated um, environment inside the CPU where developers can actually um, have uh, reassurance that the code being executed at the hardware level uh, can be tampered with. Uh, so that's how they basically create privacy and smart contracts on Ethereum. Um, and then the last uh, advancement in the space is called uh, ZK Starks, coming out of uh, Starkware, which is another cryptocurrency company. Uh, and basically, it's the last version of zero-knowledge proofs, but instead of using asymmetric cryptography uh, and a trusted setup like ZK SNARKs uh, uses symmetric keys, uh, specifically collision-resistant hash functions. Um, yeah, and that is uh, much faster, better, et cetera. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, you have uh, hardware wallets that have a similar implementation in terms of um, having a secure element inside that acts as a hardware filter between your private key and the execution. Uh, so yeah, this is a similar stuff as uh, what Apple does in their phones. Uh, so all of this is, yeah, the state of the art of, of uh, cryptography and trusted computing uh, this time, but the idea of applying all that to scientific research would be um, to, you know, going from uh, bits to atoms in terms of 
applying all that to companies like Transcriptic. Uh, this is a Bay Area company um, that aims to be the AWS, so the Amazon clouds of uh, biology, because what they do is um, put all the wet lab stuff inside containers, so like pipetting uh, all the um, biology wet lab processes. Uh, and automating that using APIs. So what you can do with this is you create an account as a biologist, uh, and then with code you, you automate all the stuff that you, you had to hire like 50 researchers to do uh, in the past. Uh, the problem with that is uh, there's still missing pieces in terms of the data acquisition and data generation phase. So how do you trust uh, that these guys are actually performing um, so the, the actions that you tell them, right? Uh, obviously, if you have your own uh, research team, uh, you have your own eyes to check on all that, but if you outsource and delegate all that um, possibly mission-critical research to something like that, which can, which can be on the other side of the world, how do you trust that this research and this data has not been tampered with, has not been compromised, has not been, uh, like, you know, uh, they change the process that you uh, uh, delegated to them and all that. So, um, yeah, the main idea is obviously to apply all the uh, previous techniques, including trusted computing at the hardware level on these chips, on these uh, manufacturing facilities to really go from uh, bits to atoms and complete the, the pipeline of an automated, uh, like, AI science research and, and all that. So. This is the, let's see if that works. Yeah, this is just an overview of their lab. So yeah, there's a robot that automates the, in that case, the pipetting. And you can, yeah, code all that and save uh, tons of time. Uh, so there's a few missing pieces, right, in terms of the final vision would be integrating all these processes into one pipeline where you can go from uh, your um, Jupyter notebook uh, and your, you know, like wet lab notebook to, uh, to this. And yeah, the next video is, um, oops. The fundamental yeah. way in which we conduct our lab research really hasn't changed that much from the days of Pastor. The present actually looks a lot like the past. As I like to say, there's much more voodoo in science than anyone is willing to admit. We want to eliminate that stuff as much as we can. People would print out pictures and tape them in their notebooks and expect that to be the way that like data is, is tracked and passed along. And opportunities are open to My grandmother was actually a chemist back in the 40s. I actually spent some time reading her thesis. It was hard to tell whether this was done in um, the 40s or you know today. Most organic chemists think of themselves more as artists than actual scientists. You get things that look more like food recipes, like add a dash of this and a dash of that. It's very hard to reproduce. Finally, someone sat down and said, like, well, why don't we just take the experiment and turn it into code? The system that we generated is an emergent property of thinking about how to move the science forward in the most effective way possible. The Emerald Cloud Lab allows anyone with a laptop to direct experiments from anywhere in the world. It's also a way to automatically parcel information and store it, so you never have to go searching through old notebooks. All the data is tied together. A robot can do a lot of scientific techniques better than humans can, and all of that can be described in code and in a database. It's very exciting. There's no need for people to be in the lab to actually run the experiment or to have access to the data. It's instantly available to anybody, anywhere. When we noticed that when we started going to the lab in the morning and there was no one in it, yet all these things were running. Because everything is standardized, you have all the information about how you carried out the experiment the first time. You can very quickly reproduce that, that data over and over again. If you can fully reproduce, if you can fully encapsulate, that means you can basically abstract it out and you can build on top of that. The ECL allows us to answer much bigger questions in biology that we wouldn't otherwise be able to answer. 
It allows you to be acting as the architect of the science rather than actually carrying out the experiments themselves because everything is automated. We're not doing this just to do it. We're doing this because we think that the way science has been done is not rigorous enough. So one of the ways this is going to change life sciences is by making each individual scientist much more powerful. You're only limited by the experiments that you can dream up. There's this great quote about standing on the shoulders of giants, and that's how we make progress in science. I think that kind of undersells it a little bit, but we should be standing on all of each other's shoulders. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Hello. Um, I'm over here. Um, a lot of science, I think, involves not putting things in the code, but um, actually observations that arrive very, like, in a very seridipidus seri seri uh, manner. So um, how would it work in the situation where you divorce the scientist from uh, experience of natural processes um, and it's all very pre-programmed, predetermined? How would you, you know, how, how do you envisage discovery in this kind of yeah, ecosystem? Yeah. Definitely, that's a good point. And this was mainly, let's say, to automate the second step of the scientific process. So the first step you mentioned is the idea generation phase or um, so th after that you would then uh, go on to verify that hypothesis and on, you know, and go on with the process. And in that instance, in this example for like wet lab biology, you would uh, then, you know, verify your experiment and maintain your experiment using these techniques instead of uh, going through the process that we know about, like hiring, uh, I don't know, like 10 uh, PhD researchers if you don't already have your own lab. So this could obviously open the door to lots of uh, citizen uh, science that today is mostly related only to like data crunching and stuff that, uh, you know, you have initiatives like BioCurious in the US and iGEM so that uh, citizen science scientists can also do wet lab research on their own, but it's very, very limited, right? So if you have this kind of pipeline completed, uh, it would open uh, doors, yeah. I would say that most experiments are very difficult to make to, to work, so um, a lot of experiments do fail for various reasons, because the, the practice that involves in the outcome um, um, you know, can vary so much. Sure, sure, but th that's exactly the point. So. Sure, sure. Um, how would you interpret uh, failures in, in your ecosystem? Um, well, so this would also kind of tackle the re reproducibility crisis in, in that specific case for like wet lab experiments. So as they mentioned in the video, like there's still in chemistry, you know, some like uh, processes that look like uh, food recipes, right? So if another researcher wants to uh, reproduce that, that experiment, it's very hard these days in terms of, uh, you know, the, the actual wet lab stuff. So with this, uh, it should standardize to a certain extent where the reproducibility just comes after, like you, you click another button and, and it's done, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we have lots of different labs around the world where different, slightly different conditions exist. Sure, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. In fact, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's also the missing piece in terms of this is like these are two companies in the in Silicon Valley right now, and like for the this vision to work, you will need I don't know uh, like dozens at least of other of such things around the world, uh, so more of in a decentralized way. 
Absolutely, yeah. Hi, Max. You had uh, exotic blocks going from bottom left to bottom right with all these you know, fancy encryption. Um, I was just wondering if you thought there was a box not on the slide to the bottom left, and that was the, the lightweight uh, cryptography to allow you to couple from the sensor or from that lab actually into the, the infrastructure. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts on the lightweight encryption that we can use actually on the devices. Um, yeah, for lightweight stuff, it's hard. <laughs> uh, like you can't use, as you know, homomorphic encryption. Uh, and so um, things like this are more uh, practical. Uh, I mean, obviously, a big companies uh, created this kind of stuff for cloud computing. Uh, but they're supposedly efficient enough to, to be explored for uh, mobile clients, too. OK, for other questions. Otherwise, let's thank all the speakers once again.